Hey folks, Dr. Mike here for RP Plus, Renaissance Periodization, and all those other funny acronyms. Hypertrophy Concepts and Tools, lecture number 16, Excessively High Frequencies. Last time we talked about excessively low frequencies. Let's see what's on the menu for today. First of all, we'll talk about why the fuss, why it's possible to have these frequencies be excessively high. And then we'll talk about nine specific reasons why excessive frequency can be a problem. And then lastly, we'll talk about how to sort of synthesize this and make some recommendations to make sure we're not doing excessively high frequencies. So why the fuss? First of all, doing less volume per session, but more frequent sessions means you get about the same muscle growth as you get with less frequent sessions, but with more volume per session. It tends to cancel out for many frequencies. That's not really a, a good argument for high frequencies because unless you like to train a muscle group really often, you could say just, you know, doing a couple extra sets while you're already warmed up, et cetera, is just same amount of growth. But it seems like for short periods of time, at least one to two mesocycles, you could probably get superior results, better results with higher frequencies that is both equated for volume and not equated for volume because with higher frequencies, you can do more volume. So it's a sort of double benefit. However, if we take that trend too far, then we run into problems because you can say, gee, you know, four times a week training works well, better than two for some amount of time. Eight times a week training should work great. And then you run into the problem of excessively high frequencies. Uh, and there are a couple of reasons why that's not a really, really good thing. And at some point, essentially, because you have to control for per session volume, the volumes are really, really low per session and the sessions are too frequent. What does that mean? How does that happen? Let's take a look at those nine independent downsides. So first one is post-activation potentiation. Let's say we were endeavor to do one working set per session and do, I don't know, whatever our MAV is, 14 sessions per week, twice a day. You do one set of chest in the AM, one set of chest in the PM every day for seven days. Let's say that was a thing. Post-activation potentiation is that after one hard working set, many times you are able to repeat or exceed your performance on the next working set because that working set, first one, functioned as both a warm-up and a working set. After you've activated the musculature, you get a potentiation effect. Now, if you say, well, that just means you're not adequately warmed up, sure, but then if you're training with high frequencies and you warm up a lot, you're spending a whole lot of time in the gym that you might not need to be just to do one working set. So you might as well do two working sets at that point. But if you can do two working sets, one functions as a work set and a warm up, And the next one is just as good of a set. You get just as many reps, so on and so forth, and maybe even recruit more fast twitch muscle fibers, which a lot of times happens with post-activation potentiation, then maybe all of a sudden for the literal same amount of time investment, you would do two working sets versus one working set with a bunch of warm ups. And if you could do two working sets like that, maybe you could just do three working sets and the potentiation effect probably lasts that long. And the third set maybe is not as high quality, but still really high quality. We'll get to other reasons why it's a good idea to maybe do that third set. With the very least of someone saying, let's just do one set and then leave the gym, probably doing two sets, spending the same amount of time getting more hypertrophy, a little less warming up, a little bit more work is probably wise. And when you start doing two sets per session, uh, you know, it might be a little bit more fatigue and maybe you can't do 14 sessions anymore. Maybe you can only do seven sessions, right? So there's an automatic argument for excessively high frequencies being not so great. That it, your first set potentiates at least the second and to some extent, even the third set in performance, you end up putting three really high quality sets back to back to back and you're uh, off to a really good start. So it's sort of like when you're in the gym, you might as well stay in the gym for a while, which means you there's a certain minimum volume per session that you should accumulate because it's just really, really efficient. And then after that, you could go home and still have a very high frequency. But if you cut it off before then, like instead of doing three or four sets per muscle group per session, if you just do one, you may be doing such a high frequency that it's going to be needless to do that at the very least, right? Number two, total work versus faster fiber stimulus. This one's on shaky ground. If it has an effect, it's probably a very small effect, but we still have to consider it. So in any set you do, as you get closer to failure, especially when it's a set of, let's say, 10 to 20, roughly 15 reps, let's just use 15. 15 reps, let's just keep it simple, let's say to failure. We know via the effective reps concept, that the last five reps of that set are probably the most hypertrophic. 
It doesn't mean the first 10 are not, but it certainly means the first five of those 15 is not super hypertrophic because the faster fibers aren't very super active yet. And they are active to some extent, but not maximally. And so they don't get grow much and they're the ones that grow the most. You know, so reps number five through 10, they're very hypertrophic and 10 through 15 is super hypertrophic and more than that. I mean, it's one of those up, up like this. It's not like that, right? Um, but generally speaking, your last five reps are going to be your sort of higher quality reps. If you just do one set every single time you come to the gym and you leave, let's say it's a set of 15, you have essentially you could describe roughly 10 lead-in reps that don't cause a ton of hypertrophy, not your best hypertrophy. And then you have five reps in that set that cause your best hypertrophy. Well, what if you did a set like that and then you did your next set after a good amount of rest? Now, since the first set was to failure and you rested a normal amount of time, maybe instead of 15 reps, you got 10 reps on this next set. Still a very hypertrophic set, but it turns out that instead of, you know, 10 lead-in reps, remember the last five reps are the most hypertrophic in a set of 10, you now have five lead-in reps and five maximally hypertrophic reps. So the amount of faster fiber stimulus relative to total work done is better, right? Imagine we do as even more extreme example, sets of 30 reps. The first 25 reps are more lead-in than the best hypertrophy. But if you allowed yourself to do multiple sets, you would fatigue in such a way that the last five reps would be a bigger fraction of each set coming up. To a set of 30, the last five reps are only one-sixth of that. In a set of 40, they're only one-fourth of that. More, right? Or a set of 40, good God. In a set of 20, they're one-fourth of that. In a set of 10, they're half. Is half your reps are the highest quality, most uh, growth-causing reps. So there's something to that idea that, and it's especially one of these things where it's the local fatigue that's sort of causing this, that as you do more and more sets, yes, the hypertrophy from each set uh, additively declines. But remember, the same thing happens for adding frequency to your program. So that's a canceled out argument altogether. But while it declines, it declines a little, maybe less fast than we would think, right? And in that case, we are able to have more faster fiber stimulus relative to total stimulus. Thus, your stimulus to fatigue ratio may actually be pretty decent for more than just one set, right? Your stimulus to fatigue ratio on the second set might be pretty similar to what it was uh, on the first set, and thus it might be worth it to stick around and do another set, and maybe another one, and maybe another one. So instead of just doing one set per session, maybe because our faster fiber stimulus relative to total work, same concept that goes exactly into myo reps, maybe we could have a slightly better result if we stick around and use that local fatigue to our advantage to get into that best hypertrophy zone for more fractions of those sets. Maybe, right? Number three, mind-muscle connection potentiation. This one's super straightforward. Your first set often feels like fucking weird dog shit. You don't know if your biceps are activated. You just kind of lift the weight. Yeah, you get a bunch of reps. Who knows what muscles are involved? But if you zoom in on the per the specific muscle, as you do more and more sets to a point, we calculated RP or calculate, estimate that at roughly five to seven sets, uh, at least in the same exercise, your uh, at least in the first three sets and probably three or four, your mind-muscle connection improves with every single set. And you have no doubt experienced this. First set of leg presses feels kind of strange. I mean, you get good. You got, you got a lot of reps, but like you're just sort of feeling the groove towards the last couple reps. Then the next set, you're really grooving it. You're warmed up super well. You feel a ton of tension through your quads and not a ton of fatigue because you've gotten your stance right and everything and you can feel it super well. And then the next set, you just total nuclear disaster. It's awesome. And then if you keep doing sets after three or four, sure, the um, uh, mind-muscle connection can drop off and it can be like you're just doing work again. Maybe it's time to move away to another exercise or maybe even stop the session. But there's a mind-muscle uh, the potentiation thing where your first set might be your most hypertrophic. It just has to be because it just fills in the bar the highest and the rest is up to the other sets to take uh, of potential hypertrophy. There might be a thing where because mind muscle connection improves a little bit with every set for a few number of sets, that if you were to just leave after one set or even two sets, you would be leaving these super high quality sets on the table. And then every time you come back and do another session, 
You remember your mind-muscle connection is not that great. You have to rewarm up. This is a little bit canceled out by the fact that if you train more frequently, your technique gets better. But then again, if you train really frequently, your technique can degrade from just overexposure. So there's a balance there where it's like, you know, the, the expression in for a penny, in for a pound. If you're in for one set, of working set, you might as well do another at least one, probably two or three more because that mind muscle improves set to set. There's some benefit there to keep going. It at least mitigates the stimulus to fatigue ratio loss you would expect with sets over and over and over again. Next one is technical potentiation. This one's super simple, super related to mind muscle connection. Your first set of squats, your toes might've been pointed out a little too much. Okay, everyone makes that mistake every now and again or too forward. But on your second set, like if you only do one set per session, your frequency is that high, 14 sessions per week. You only do one set per session, you're like, fuck. Okay, next session, I'm going to remember to point them out. You get to the next session, it's fucking hours later. You're like, well, what did I have my feet, right? Who the fuck knows? Right? And your quads might have shifted in fluid volumes to the last session. You might have eaten a meal, so on and so forth. So now you don't, it might actually be a different foot position that gets you your best feel. But if you do multiple sets of the same exercise or of the same muscle group, you can alter the technique to where your third, second, third, fourth sets are incrementally better and better and better technique. You settle into the technique even for that day or just for that exercise always because you know, okay, the first set technique was meh, but I can turn my feet in a little bit. You turn your feet in and your second set's awesome. And you're like, ooh, you know what? If I move my heels up a little bit, I think I can get an even better feel. And that third set, it's fucking gravy. And that fourth set, you've already figured all these things out. You've paid that cost. You might as well do a fourth set because it's going to be an awesome set. It might not be any better than the third, but you've, you're grooving, right? It's like just learning how to sort of ride your bike a little bit. And your dad's like, all right, time to go have dinner. You're like, ah, <laughs> I'm for balancing for the first time. Let me at least get this high quality work in so I don't have to relearn balancing tomorrow, so on and so forth, right? So when you're in the groove, don't fuck with the groove. This covers actually a lot of these, right? Definitely something there, especially with technique. Cell swelling and metabolites, they may very well be, especially for more advanced lifters, a certain amount of threshold involved in cell swelling and metabolites, whereby if the muscle cell that's used to being uh, uh, swelled and has already milked out the minimum hypertrophy for minimum swelling, it may be uh, the effect that if you have minimum swelling for uh, the kind of pump you get from one or two sets, they might actually at some point cause no additive hypertrophy for especially more advanced lifters, and that only a great degree of swelling causes any incremental detection of hypertrophy. Same idea for metabolites. A certain summation of metabolites in the cell may, if submaximal, very submaximal, cause no added growth or very, very little added growth. And then just going that extra number of sets gets the metabolites to really sum up to where you have notable or much larger degrees of hypertrophy. It's kind of like a, you know, if in for a penny, in for a pound, right? And, and more than that, it's kind of like, you know, if you are going to make something, an effort to train, you have to make a minimum effort at some point or things don't just don't happen. Uh, easy analogy here is kind of um, getting a massage. How come five-minute massages are really rare and maybe you can have like 20 of them per day? Well, one of the big things in the literature, truth be told, the only thing that massage has a benefit on, it's a huge benefit, is, re is uh, recovery, and that's from relaxation, right? But like how many people can really relax from a five-minute massage? I don't know about you guys. I don't get massages very often, but when I do, five minutes is kind of, you're just kind of like, okay, 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 stop thinking about work, just blah, woo listen to that stupid meditation music they play, just kidding, sort of. And, and then you really like... 15, 20 minutes later, oof, you're really relaxed. And that's when the relaxation starts to happen and starts to affect you. The getting relaxed doesn't really get you anything. It's just a prep for the process. Once you are relaxed, then it's great. So I got a massage session of 30 minutes, an hour. That is like, you know, 20 minutes or 40 minutes of meat and potatoes relaxation. That's awesome. In a similar way, it might be that cell swelling metabolites, which do contribute to hypertrophy, though not uh, exclusively, uh, it might be that up until you get a good amount of both cell swelling metabolites, you're really just priming the pump. And if you prime the pump, prime the pump, then leave, ah, there might not be as much growth, maybe no growth there for advanced folks. So there is such a thing as, you know, you do one set of, of chest uh, press and someone's like, are you pumped? You're like, no, not yet. One set doesn't get pumped. And you're like, all right, super crazy burn in there and you have trouble flexing your muscle. Like, no, not at all. 
uh, let's leave and then come back five hours later and do another set of chest presses. Uh, right? So then we can't really check the boxes uh, as much or maybe at all of cell swallowing metabolites actually causing an effect on growth. So maybe if we're going to do one set, maybe we could do two, three, and even four. We get a really robust cell swelling effect, really robust metabolite effect. For sure, we've put in a ton of tension. And then maybe it's a really, really good thing. Maybe. So that's something to consider. Point number six is one of those that's not so debatable. It's just very, very clear. It's a clear win for lower frequency. If you train with a very high frequency, you will be doing a whole lot of warming up. One of the easiest ways to explain this is if you do only one warm up set, which is ridiculous, most people do more. Let's say only one. Only one warm up set and one working set, then your week can be categorized as a one to one ratio of warm up to work sets. One half of the time that you're in the gym, assuming both sets take about as much time, which both sets really usually do, um, you spend half your fucking time warming up. Okay, okay. What if you take one warm up set still, but do two working sets. You have a two to one ratio now. That's so much better than a one to one ratio of working out to warming up. If you're like most people, you can train with at least two or three working sets per session, more like three or four. You know, that's a three or four to one ratio of working out to warming up. You're mostly working out. But honestly, think about it from a real world perspective. If you want maximum efficiency, time efficiency of your training, and half of your training is spent warming up, good God. And, and, and there's another priming the pump effect there, or the in, in for a penny, in for a pound effect. What's a quickie? You're warmed up already. You've done one set. Now you're really warmed up. Going back to point number one, it's post-activation potentiation. And why not do another set? <laughs> uh, it's not going to be as productive as the first set, maybe by a very small amount, but holy crap, it improves your efficiency like crazy. Something to be said for it. Something absolutely to be said. Next one, another non-debatable one, or of course it's debatable, but it's pretty highly convincing. Point number seven, joint and connective tissue versus muscle recovery time course discordance. That's a lot of sciencey talk for if you train with very high frequencies, the muscles tend to recover a little bit faster than joints and connective tissues, tendons, ligaments, uh, epineuroses, et cetera. And what ends up happening is for some time, that means you get great muscle growth, but then you run a, run a, uh, on dry land and you end up getting in a real overreach scenario with your connective tissues and your joints, and then that is not sustainable. So this isn't to say so much that high-frequency training is a bad idea uh, all the time, or sorry, so, some of the time, it, it's a bad idea all the time because eventually you won't be able to recover in a sustainable fashion. Because most bodybuilders don't alter their frequencies on purpose, they just want one sort of dependable frequency. Many bodybuilders default to one uh, or two sessions per week per muscle group because those cannot possibly, uh, in any real sense, lead to a connective tissues becoming a limiting factor problem. But if you're you know, training four or six times per week per muscle, that may not be sustainable for the connective tissues for nearly as long as it's sustainable for the muscles, and you might perennially run into really, really big problems, right? So that's definitely something to consider. Maybe not from saying high frequencies are bad, or there's such a thing as too high a frequency, but there's certainly such a thing as too high a frequency for too long at a time. Number eight, local versus systemic fatigue ratio. You have a certain amount of work to do. Let's say you're training chest and back. This is the example we're going to be using in the book. You can, let's say, do four sets per session. That's what you do, and you do it multiple times a week, chest and back. If you do four sets of back, four sets of chest next time, four sets of back next time after that, four sets of chest, it's just chest or back for four sets in a row. You get same a certain amount of systemic fatigue at the end of that session, but you get a... a a lot of local fatigue because you're training the same muscle over and over, local fatigue accumulates. Remember, local fatigue eventually is bad, but local fatigue via cell swelling metabolites, maybe some fiber type stuff, also causes you to have a little bit of hypertrophy. So it's both hypertrophic and antihypertrophic. Okay. So your local to systemic fatigue ratio in the last two sets of chest or back, like four sets of chest or four sets of back, in the last two sets of both of those, your local fatigue is here, your systemic fatigue is here, so the ratio is like one to one. Mm, not terrible, right? Some of that causes growth and systemic fatigue. Local fatigue causes some growth. Systemic fatigue doesn't cause any growth at all. It's all, all bad. What if you start doing a situation where every workout is mixed? 
right? Higher frequency per muscle group, double the frequency. Every workout is two sets of chest, two sets of back, or two sets of back, two sets of chest. For those last two sets of whatever it is, let's say back, the systemic fatigue of those last two sets is the same because chest and back contribute roughly the same systemic fatigue. But the local fatigue in those first two sets could be almost zero to start out. By the end of the two sets, pretty low because you're essentially after two sets of chest coming to back tired, systemically tired. And now your systemic inhibition of growth is pretty high, but your local fatigue contribution to growth is very low. So the systemic to local fatigue ratio shifts in favor of the systemic, and now you're just training tired a lot. If you're gonna train tired, you might as well be tired from the local muscle itself, because that kind of tiredness also makes you grow. But if you mix and match too much and you do too much whole body training, let's say, where you every single session, you do every single muscle group you have, six days a week, you do six, you know, uh, quads every day, glutes every day, blah, 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 blah. You end up having that towards the end of those workouts, the systemic fatigue is massive, but the local fatigue is relatively small because you didn't have a chance to accumulate it, which means it's more junk volume than if you concentrated on every single muscle getting its due diligence and then leaving the gym or fewer muscles being stuck in together right? That's a bit of a technical one. So feel free to rewind and re-listen again. And there's other uh, contexts in which I describe this. It's a very theoretical thing, but it almost certainly happens. And it's something to think about, right? You want the muscle to be trashed, not to do two sets of pulldowns after you've done a bunch of benching. And someone's like, hey, man, those you really feel those on your back? You're like, no, because I'm too tired from bench. But if you're too tired from bent rows, then those sets of pulldowns are giving you an even bigger pump now, which you don't have to build from scratch. So definitely something to consider. Lastly, excessive systemic fatigue. This is a very interesting one. If you train with a very high frequency, you are actually able to raise your per session volumes pretty considerably to the point where your overall weekly volume can get crazy high. I've tried this myself where my training partners and I have tried to train with 12 sessions per week total, not per muscle group, but that meant four per muscle group training sessions every time. The volume we could end up doing was so high, it exceeded our systemic MRV and we just couldn't survive. So if you say to yourself, man, if I do really high frequency quad training and glute training and hamstring training six days a week, I can get a net total greater amount of sets done per week and grow 100%. Can you survive that systemically, doing a leg day every single day? Maybe not. If you're advanced, definitely not, right? So sometimes super high frequencies per muscle end up allowing you to do so much work that they take you over your systemic MRV. And it's just something to be aware of, which is to say not chasing high frequencies blindly as the, the golden thing that's going to get you all the gains. You have to put it in context, not go in blind. So with that, let's focus on the recommendations. Here they are. If a muscle isn't sore and performance is back up over baseline, you can train ASAP no problem. In the last lecture, we said you should train soon and not dilly-dally too much to make sure your frequencies aren't too low. To make sure your frequencies aren't too high, it's definitely not a problem if you train ASAP. No big deal. So if you're not sore and your performance is back to baseline, you can train. No worries. But at the same time, if you do so high frequency of training that in order to squish that much frequency into your week, you're reducing your per session volume to less than three to four sets per muscle group per session, at the very least from an efficiency perspective and almost certainly from a connective tissue perspective, you're just not doing the best job you could be, right? And for mind muscle, and there's a couple other ones that all sum up to saying at least this, the benefit of training with frequencies so high that you can only do one or two sets per session is probably at least no higher and maybe a little lower than a frequency that allows you to train at least three to four sets per session. So then why would you do one or two? It causes all these problems. It's really, really inefficient and you don't have to do it at the very least. And in the best case, it might actually be a little worse. So the super, super take home point here is if you're designing a frequency of training and you sort of know your MRV and know how long it takes you to recover and you say, okay, I want to train quads four days a week, but at least one of those days is going to have to be like just one or two sets of quads. Uh, just condense, consolidate and do three quads a week where at least you do three or four sets per session. 
And in that case, you're getting amazing workouts, maybe the best, and not going excessively into high frequencies in a sort of programmatic fashion, you end up having to lose efficiency on the other end, right? It's kind of like programming yourself to eat 12 meals per day instead of six. Uh, what's the benefit of 12 meals? There's probably no big downside, but there's no additional benefit beyond six. And it's a huge convenience cost. Very, very similar to training frequency, right? Um, most muscles can recover from three plus sets at least three times a week, some even higher at five to six, but some muscles cannot recover as quickly and can't even do three times a week in advanced athletes that are very strong. Hamstrings, chest, and quads often can only be trained hard twice a week because anything else is overkill. That's absolutely a thing. Um, and, you know, yeah, you can train them more times by making each session one or two sets. Uh, and then you wonder why you're doing that. And especially with muscles that require a lot of warm up, that turns into a ton of work. Like if you're training, if you're very strong, 400 plus pound squatter, you're training quads, you know, four or five times a week. That's a whole shitload of warming up where if you just trained them two or three times a week, the warming up isn't nearly as excessive because once you're warm, you can just keep doing work sets. And even when you change exercises, you just need to minimally warm up or not at all, where it just makes a whole lot more sense from a time efficiency perspective, right? Definitely something to think about. So you don't want to just assume that every muscle can do 3X or 4X or 5X. You got to go muscle by muscle. And lastly, when shooting for very high frequencies, keep in mind the connective tissue recovery problems and only do this for one or two mesos at a time. Really push through high frequencies that you know are costing your connective tissues. It's okay to do for one or two mesos at a time and then go back to lower frequencies or intermediate frequencies for a while. Let your connective tissues and joints and so on and forth recover. And then you can make another push into higher frequencies. Give that some thought. Folks, see you next time for the next lecture.